I'm going to start with my personal story. I'm an internal medicine physician, and 15 years ago, I gave birth to my first child. I knew that I wanted to breastfeed, because I knew it was a good thing, generally, and I read a bit about it when I was pregnant, but when the time came, I had the breastfeeding nightmare. Um, my child got dehydrated in the hospital. Uh, he didn't gain weight well. I struggled, and I suffered. But I also read and learned whatever I could in an effort to try to help myself. Um, and because I was a doctor who worked in a hospital, I was able to realize that it was the medical system that had failed me, not that I was a failure. By the time my second child came along two years later, breastfeeding was much easier. It wasn't just because he was my second kid, it was because what I had learned through all my reading the first time around, I had wished so badly that someone had just told me just a few basic things so that I wouldn't have had to suffer. So I just became determined that no one would have to go through what I went through just to feed their baby. And that's why I'm here with you today. It was clear to me that mothers were not getting enough support. And it also seemed that we had this incredible single health intervention that had the potential for profound public health impact across the lifespan. And so I kept educating myself, and I kept asking questions. And one of my questions was, what is not breastfeeding actually costing our society? I mean, to really get breastfeeding rates up there, it's going to take an investment. It's going to take building an infrastructure. But how can we know how much money to spend if we don't know what not breastfeeding is actually costing us? At the least, what is the cost of the diseases of childhood? Because that's what we know the most about. We know the medical recommendations, exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months of life with continued breastfeeding for at least the first year. And we know that our current rates fall for far short of that. But what's the cost to our society of the difference? So as the Affordable Care Act was being drafted, I set out to find out with my colleague and friend Arnold Reinhold. And our work made big headlines when it came out in 2010. We found $13 billion in costs, including the cost of 911 excess premature deaths when we looked at current breastfeeding rates compared to the cost of 90% of infants uh, compared to the cost if 90% of infants were breastfed according to medical recommendations. But we also knew, even at that time, that that was only part of the cost, because we knew there was also the cost of maternal disease. At that time, there was more and more evidence that maternal disease was rapidly emerging. There was more and more evidence on maternal disease emerging even since we were working on our paper that had come out in 2010. And so together with <clears throat> the late Dr. Michael Foster, Dr. Eleanor Bimler-Schwartz, Dr. Allison Stubbe, and Christine Luongo, who's not pictured there, Arnold and I set out to find this out with support from the WUK Kellogg Foundation. And we used a different methodology from our pediatric paper we built a computer model that ran Monte Carlo simulations, which could tell us whether the results we would come up with were real or could just be by chance alone. And our pediatric paper couldn't tell us that. So we published those results last June, and we found about $18 billion in cost, most of which was the cost of over 4,000 excess premature deaths in women. We found Almost 5,000 excess cases of breast cancer, almost 14,000 excess heart attacks, and nearly 54,000 excess cases of high blood pressure. But the problem was we can't just add these two numbers together, the 13 billion and the 18 billion, because the methodologies were different and the maternal methods were more rigorous. So we came back to the Kellogg Foundation and we asked them for more support. So now we have an even bigger team. And we, we went back through all the pediatric data. We completely updated it. And we're going through and rewriting the computer code. I say we, but I really mean like Brittany and Andrew, um, as we did for women. And we're building one unified model with unified cost numbers. 
And as a group, we went through all the literature through the 15 diseases we ended up using, as well as a bunch of diseases we ended up deciding not to use. And then for those diseases we chose, we ended up, we had to figure out which papers to use to figure out which odds ratios to use to best represent the relationship of the risk of disease to breastfeeding. This has been incredibly painstaking and tedious and thoughtful. Um, and we're building an even bigger computer model, <clears throat> and we're improving on the incredibly complicated maternal model that we had previously built, in addition to adding the pediatric model to the piece. Um, Brittany and Andrew and Arnold especially have been doing incredible work on the code and on the math piece and on the data analysis. In other words, don't try this at home. <laughs> so today I'm presenting to you the preliminary report on our pediatric results only. So in 2010, we looked at 10 pediatric diseases. Today we're reporting on 10 pediatric diseases as well, but they're not the same 10 diseases. Since 2010, the data linking breastfeeding and asthma, eczema, and type 1 diabetes has gotten weaker. So we actually excluded those from our model. But on the other hand, the data on Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis has solidified, so we included those in our model. And then we split leukemia into two different subtypes. Um, the data on SIDS and breastfeeding has gotten stronger, and then we've used new data, thanks to Tara, <coughs> from uh, necrotizing enterocolitis from the neonatal research network, which is incredibly powerful. This is unpublished data. Um, but it is so compelling that it and other studies make me think that we may even be able to come close to eliminating deaths from necrotizing enterocolitis using breast milk in the future. So here's what we found. In this top group, otitis media and diarrhea, it would take very few women breastfeeding to prevent a single case of these diseases. Very few, like say under 10 women breastfeeding. These aren't serious diseases, but the average US baby gets about two cases each. So that's a lot of time missed from work for their parents, a lot of doctor visits, and a lot of costs. In the second group, it would take only a moderate number of women to breastfeed to prevent a single case of one of these diseases. Note that this group includes not only neck, but deaths from neck. Let me say that again, deaths from neck. Neck is a serious life-threatening disease of preterm infants, and exposure to infant formula seems to play an important role in its pathogenesis. In the bottom group, it would take a larger amount of women to prevent a single case of those diseases. Part of this is because these diseases are relatively rare. There are only about 2,000 cases of SIDS per year, and although each case is devastating, breastfeeding cuts the risk of SIDS by nearly 75%. So now let's look at the deaths. We found between 1,100 and 1,200 excess deaths from suboptimal breastfeeding, which is a few hundred more deaths than we found in 2010. Most of the deaths were from SIDS, followed by neck with lower respiratory tract infections as a close third. The relationship between exposure to infant formula and death from neck and SIDS is now known to be stronger than it was from the data we used in 2010. So what does this all mean now for you and me? It means, I think, that breastfeeding is worth the investment. It's worth supporting families so that they can breastfeed. I'm really pleased to see that we have seen amazing progress on, from the CDC and other agencies and the Joint Commission on getting the medical system to do right by mothers. And it's really heartening for me to see what a huge difference that that is making. And I just want to say thank you to Dr. Grummerstrand and to everybody else for that progress. That has not been easy. That has been a long time coming, and we need to keep that infrastructure building, and we need to keep that infrastructure funded. 
but we need more. We need paid maternity leave. And we need it now. Having a baby is one of the biggest reasons women and children fall into poverty. And the United States is the only industrialized country in the world without paid maternity leave. And this disproportionately affects people of color contributing to inequities and disparities. We also need break time for all nursing mothers, and we need that now too. The Affordable Care Act the Affordable Care Act only provides this for some mothers, not for everyone. So as it turns out, there are bills to do both of these things already in Congress, the Family Act and the Support for Working Mothers Act. The Family Act would provide up to 12 weeks leave at 66% pay. And because it's an insurance bill and not a handout, it would not cost business as much. So we should really be asking our legislators to co-sponsor these bills so that they could move along in Congress. But most of what our research is telling me and what it's, is that it's really, really worth supporting the mothers of premature babies so that they can provide their own milk to their babies and be there physically for their babies. Most of these premature babies actually end up doing quite well, and they're worth the investment. Now, the Family Act would help these mothers do this, but for most of those women, it really wouldn't be enough. A mother of a preterm baby cannot choose between her next paycheck and keeping her baby alive. Whether a mother of a preterm baby works at McDonald's or works as a brain surgeon, nothing she gets paid could possibly be worth more than the value of her own milk keeping her infant alive. Yes, breastfeeding is worth the investment. We need to level the playing field for all Americans. Paid leave won't just help women breastfeed. It will help women from going into poverty when they have a child. It will help women support, sorry, it will help support women who have preterm infants. It will make us a stronger, healthier, and more productive nation. It will help reduce the growing gap between rich and poor that is actually eroding our civilized society. Women, after all, hold up half the sky. Thank you.